Welcome to Digital Ship webinar on getting your shipboard cybersecurity right with three guest speakers that we have invited. First, Lori Eve, Director of Maritime Retailing in Marsat, Yuri Hart, CEO at Port IT, and Mihalis Mihaloliakos, Team Leader Cybersecurity and Network at TMS Cardiff Gas. This is the second webinar from the Maritime Cybersecurity Series sponsored by Inmarsat. Um, and first, I'm inviting Carl Jeffrey, founding editor of Digital Ship, to share some of his recent observations into cybersecurity topic. Okay, thank you. So the theme is shipping cybersecurity, so shipboard cybersecurity. We're looking in particular at compliance with the IMO 2021 rules. So one point I thought I'll begin with, because I think it's often misunderstood, is that the rules are about risk management. And for many people in the shipping industry, you see compliance sort of following a list of rules, because there are a lot of rules you have to follow in shipping, but that's not what we're talking about here. So um, just quoting from the IMO website, the IMO resolution encourages administrations to ensure that cyber risks are appropriately addressed in existing safety management systems no later than the first annual verification of the document of compliance after 1st of January 2021. So it's not just me that's saying this. Here's a quote from Julian Clark, who's the global senior partner with Ince & Co in an International Chamber of Shipping webinar on February the 10th on cybersecurity. He said, we've got to get away from a tick box approach to compliance. You need a resilience policy that ensures you're constantly on top of and, re and reviewing the exposure to the organization. So my own understanding of risk management, I heard a talk by Lord Cullen, who led the UK government inquiry into the Piper Alpha oil platform disaster in the North Sea in 1988, when 167 people died. So he, he led the sort of report into it, understanding what, what went wrong. And he gave a talk, he said, so risk management is a process for evaluating risks and what you're doing about the risks. Then you've got systems for auditing how good your risk assessment is, systems for making sure you're following up on your deficiencies, and you've got regulators behind all of this, making sure the whole system is working. And maybe the most important thing is all of this should be inquisitive, not cozy. So somebody's saying, I've managed the risk. Somebody else is saying, have you thought about this risk? Have you thought about that risk? So we're going to hear advice about how to approach this today. So first of all, we're going to hear from Laurie Eve, who's Director of Maritime Retail at Inmarsat. He's also a former captain in the UK Royal Marines. I don't know much about the Marines, but I can guess that there's a lot of... Uh, assessing risk involved in that. Um, we've got Yuri Hart, who's the CEO of cybersecurity consultancy Port IT. He's going to talk about security solutions, which can help you manage the risks. So that's hardware and software and strengths and weaknesses of different systems. So you can't just rely on antivirus. And he's also going to present the company's findings from his own monitoring, including trends from phishing and spyware and board and some tips on managing risk of operations technology. And finally, we're going to hear from Dr. Michalis Mikaloliakos, who's going to talk about his practical experience as team leader, cybersecurity and network at TMS Cardiff Gas and TMS Tankers. So he's going to talk about what he sees as trends in operational technology on board ships, including the difference between what you see today and on a new build tanker a few years ago, and some advice about how to approach it. So TMS Cardiff Gas has got a fleet of 16 LNG vessels and TMS Tankers has 25 Aframaxes, six Ice Class vessels, 14 Suez Maxes, three VLCCs, two MR1s. So that's 50 vessels altogether. So he's got a very good position to see the big picture. So the structure, we've got three 10 minute presentations, first from Laurie, then from Yuri, then from Michalis. There should be plenty of time for questions. You can load up questions any time in the Q&A box and the speakers can also reply in text. So perhaps Laurie and Yuri will, will reply to questions in text while the other presentations are going on. So first I'd like to invite Laurie to give the opening talk. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, just got my presentation up. Okay, right. Okay, so uh, I think what we'll do is we'll we'll talk about IMO 2021 to start with and um, and a few uh, cover the basics. Um, so I think it's very much a key driver right now for uh, ship owners and managers to um, place a much higher priority on on preparing and updating their uh, cybersecurity measures. Um, so today I want to um, uh, talk about getting ready and how to maintain compliance with uh, IMO 2021. 
uh, maritime cyber risk management in safety management systems. So we see uh, scary headlines like this one, uh, unfortunately, on the daily uh, occurrence globally now. Um, and this headline is one which I picked out uh, last uh, July, I think it was, um, stating that cyber attacks in the maritime industry's OT systems uh, reportedly increased by 900% over the last three years. Um, and whilst we see headlines of the significantly damaging attacks uh, regularly, th this is just a tiny fraction of the, uh, the attacks taking place. Uh, and I know Yuri will uh, also cover some real world examples uh, in his presentation later. So let's start by um, looking a little more at uh, the IMO 2021 resolution. Um, as a reminder, the IMO adopted the resolution on maritime cyber risk management and safety management systems in June 2017. And I've highlighted here a couple of the key sentences, I won't read them out, um, and also have noticed the reference to MSC file CERT 3. Uh, which is a, a high level recommendation on, on maritime cyber risk management. And I'll, and I'll come to that shortly. But essentially what I wanted to talk about here is what does this actually mean to ship owners and ship managers? Uh, well, in practice at the highest level, a ship must demonstrate that uh, the vessel has considered the risks from cyber uh, and what it would do in the case of an incident. So you could compare this to addressing the risk of fire in the engine room, uh, which we're probably a lot more familiar with. Um, so, you know, we have sprinklers, we have extinguishers, we have trained crew, uh, here are the safety certificates for the extinguishers, the training record of the crew and so on. Now in cyber, what does that mean? Uh, it means, well, what assets do we have? Uh, what would we do if they don't work? Uh, what would we do if they were compromised? Who has control? So a good start for the risk management process is to identify who is the chief security officer at shore and on board uh, and what assets they have. And it's good to have some form of asset management on board, uh, like our fleet secure endpoint solution, which can, it can scan the network and it can keep a record of this for you. It can also show how uh, th those assets are being protected um, and what controls any new devices uh, joining the network have. And if a vessel doesn't comply, it can be detained and fined. Um, so for IMO 2021, a vessel should have a cyber risk plan, which covers OT and IT. And you should be aware the kind of hardware you have, what kind of software you have, and which is important, uh, what is connected to the network, and how you have protected this. So let's look quickly now at the guidance documents that are associated with IMO 2021. Uh, and I'll just cover the three sort of key ones here. So first of all, MSC File Cert 3. Um, these guidelines provide a, a high level set of recommendations on, on maritime cyber risk management uh, to safeguard shipping. Um, and the guidelines also include functional elements that support effective cyber risk management, namely uh, identify, protect, detect, respond and recover, uh, which are from the NIST framework and you'll hear me refer to them quite regularly. Uh, these guidelines are recommendatory and they provide an excellent introduction to cyber threats in the maritime domain. Second, uh, we've got the guidelines on cyber security on board ships, version three, uh, which is a, a pretty comprehensive document offering guidance to ship owners and operators. Uh, and it covers procedures and actions to maintain the security uh, of cyber systems in the company and on board. Again, the guideline, guidelines are intended to provide a basis for, uh, they're not, sorry, not intended to provide a basis for external auditing as such, um, but it's a really useful document which also draws, again, on the NIST framework. And then lastly here, the, the NIST framework itself, uh, which is a pretty comprehensive guide and, and, and a structure to how to manage risks, um, and it includes also for particular vessel types. Um, and, it, and it has some free to use profile templates by vessel type, which an operator could use to help identify uh, and prioritize actions for reducing the cyber risks in their fleets. Now, like many in the industry, um, at Inmosat, we've been discussing compliance a lot. Um, and in my experience, we see a few common themes that keep coming up. Now, the picture on this slide, it might not look relevant to cyber, but there is a reason uh, why I've chosen it. And that's that as an industry, we're very aware of safety at sea um, and ensuring vessel compliance in, in safety management systems um, to protect life at sea. However, with cyber security, this is less familiar ground um, and many are still really learning how to address this well. 
So what are the reasons for this? Um, well, firstly, the you know, simply the technical experience of operators in this area um, versus the speed at which the cyber threat has been evolving. Uh, one reason, uh, sorry, another key challenge often mentioned is OT. Um, and whilst IT platforms are increasingly standardized across fleets, OT can have a huge variety, uh, especially with relatively high numbers of vessel acquisitions at the moment, uh, bringing new systems into a fleet. Uh, and some OT may be unknowingly connected to the network. Another challenge uh, evident is the approach to compliance, um, with, with many people looking for a simple solution, something that will give them a certificate that they can show an auditor. Um, but as I keep saying, you know, there's no silver bullet here. Whilst we can provide solutions that, that provide a one-stop shop approach, the operator still needs to demonstrate that they have identified the risks and how they are managed on the vessel. And as Carl said in his excellent introduction, um, this is not about following a definitive checklist of the actions you must do, as it depends on the assets that you, you have and, and the risks identified. You, know, you need a risk management approach, um, and there's numerous guidelines to help with this, as, as some of the examples I've given. Uh, and this leads nicely to the NIST framework as one form of guidance, which I'm going to mention again uh, and, and just highlight because I think it, uh, it really helps structure your preparations. So whilst the IMO guidance explains at a high level what a vessel needs to protect, it doesn't specify in detail or provide any bullet points that can be simply ticked off. The five pillars of the NIST framework, however, do give a very good way to structure your approach. Relating your plan to this framework will give you a good start. And when we talk about our cyber portfolio, Fleet Secure, we relate the features to this framework to help, ensuring, uh, to help ensure that we're covering uh, each pillar, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So we've talked about the, the principles, uh, and now I'm gonna try and put this into practice and start talking about a pragmatic approach to following best practice and preparing for compliance. So if you have to follow the ISM code, then you have to comply and you have to be able to show you have a plan of what you're doing and how you have addressed the cyber risks on ship. So the first key step is to begin to plan. Uh, and to do that, you need to know what assets you have. Uh, so I suggest you run an exercise to understand all your critical hardware and software systems on board, uh, i.e. your IoT systems, navigation, engine control, cargo control, hardware and software. Uh, record the make, model, version, um, and the function on all your hardware. And once you've taken note of the uh, possible attack surface amongst your hardware and software, you can then secure them. It's also good to involve your suppliers um, to get their statement on cyber readiness uh, and to ensure that the supply chain solutions or backups are available for critical hardware for, for, you know, if it all goes wrong. Uh, for software, you can ensure your operating system is up to date and your software on all ICT and IoT systems are up to date. So you are documenting what you have, what you are going to do, and you are incorporating this into the safety management system on board. Then review, uh, and this is something that should be done continuously in my view, um, especially when any new systems are introduced. And then after the review, naturally you look to improve. Harden your systems, uh, continue to train and refresh your people, ensure that your crew can, can spot the signs of a cyber attack um, and are aware of cyber threats such as phishing emails, social engineering attacks, uh, and you could even um, include cyber attack scenarios in the ship's emergency drills. And then lastly, verify. Um, and you could, for example, use third parties to, um, to test your measures using techniques such as pen testing. But remember, this is not just about computers, but also OT and IoT systems, essentially anywhere with a door to the network. So I'm just gonna uh, cover lastly a little bit on um, our, our solution, Fleet Secure Endpoint. Um, Naturally, accelerating digitalization will bring with it more risk, um, and we need to consider the applications and the necessary security measures hand in hand. There's different approaches you can take, uh, and there's a lot of information and guidance out there, and it can get uh, a little complicated. So the solution we offer at IMARSAT is Fleet Secure Endpoint, uh, which is essentially a one-stop shop package that gives you most of the tools you need to be resilient uh, and get compliant in a single package. Um, it's much more than antivirus or endpoint security. Um, in fact, ESET uh, is only around 20% of the package. 
Uh, it has many management features such as asset management, risk management, organizational security management reporting, uh, and recently added a whole crew awareness training module. Now, as Fleet Secure Endpoints features cover all the NIST pillars from, from the IMO guidelines, you could say uh, that it's fully IMO compliant if you use it properly and integrate it into your safety management system. However, bear in mind that the IMO is a recommendation that also requires other steps, such as appointing a responsible person for cyber. And you need to do the work to document these procedures in the safety manual on board. Uh, now, I've put here on this slide uh, a link to our white paper um, on IMO 2021 cyber requirements, uh, which is well worth a read. Uh, and I hope you find it useful. You can use this QR code on the slide uh, or you can drop me an email and I can send you a link. So lastly, whilst IMO 2021 could be viewed as a challenge, um, it is a big opportunity and, in my opinion, a real driver for everyone to really tighten their security measures for a safer maritime sector uh, and perhaps making us a harder target. We've covered uh, the key documents of IMO 2021, uh, what it is, what this means for ship ownership managers. Uh, we've looked at the key guidelines that can help you get compliant uh, and we've talked about how to go about putting appropriate measures in place. So I hope that's given you uh, a good initial insight. We're always available, of course, and I'm very happy to discuss the topic further. Uh, anytime, please reach out to myself uh, or the Maritime team on, uh, on the email here anytime. Thank you very much. Well, wow, thank you very much, Laurie. So now we're going to go to Yuri Hart in Rotterdam, who's the CEO of Cybersecurity Consultancy Port IT. So we've got to talk more about the solutions. You'll see we've got a couple of questions from Renjith Thomas asking about intrusion protection systems and intrusion detection systems. I don't know if he's going to uh, <laughs> elaborate more on that during the presentation, but I'd like to welcome Yuri. Cheers. Uh, hello, everybody. You can hear me properly? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, thank you for attending. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I will focus a bit more on, on the endpoint, the UTM side, but also actually what, what are the, the costs and what do, does our uh, security operations center sees uh, in detecting real world threats. Mm. So if we look first of all, uh, before implementing a security solution, you should take a, consider the cost of the solution and why you're doing it, uh, sure, to protect your data. Uh, but often we see that uh, we did... Uh, before this webinar, we called some shipping agency ask, uh, uh, offices to ask, uh, what is the port, the cost of a port stay in the port of Rotterdam? And it's averaging uh, around $50,000 a day. So in the case a vessel can't leave port um, due to a cyber attack, uh, it will cost you at least $50,000. Then you need to fly in an engineer to, uh, to set up this, uh, a new network to configure it and so on. So that will be again, $1,500 per day. Um, if you take the average cyber cost of a vessel uh, that can range between 30 to $1,000 a month and even higher if you go uh, really out of the book, uh, which is $30 is your basic uh, antivirus uh, and up to 1000 including the NDR and UTM that I will discuss a bit later. Uh, so comparing the cost in solving the solution, so basically your insurance is far less than the possible cost of uh, having an event, cyber event that you can't leave port or set sail with the vessel. Uh, considering that, how many threats are actually being seen? Well, I've taken some of the log files in our uh, security operations center for the last five months. Uh, I only took a data set of 750 vessels. And on those 750 vessels, we found over 600,000 threats. So that's quite a lot. Uh, which of those vessels, we found 1,391 unique viruses. So meaning that almost every vessel had two unique viruses. That's, that's quite a lot. Uh, the funny thing to see is actually that in the, in the real world, in the shore side, we see uh, that the attack generic virus um, is number one at the moment because that's trying to exploit Windows, uh, Windows vulnerabilities. But in the maritime industry for the last five months, we have seen that uh, the Madang.a uh, virus is uh, number one virus. Uh, and that's a virus that's already 15 years old. So that virus is being introduced by using USB drives of crew. So actually to prevent that, you could have a proper IT policy or block USB drives on your endpoints, uh, preventing uh, such an infection. Um, if we look to ransomware, which is an issue in the maritime industry, uh, 
although it's only a 0.7% in our total detections of foul coders, as we see it, uh, it is a total of 42% of the vessels that are being hit with ransomware. And luckily, all of them have been uh, uh, protected by, uh, by the solutions in place, such as Fleet Secure Endpoint, and Fleet Secure, uh, or the UTMs in, uh, implemented. But it's, how do you call it, uh, it's a serious threat. So it's not happening that often, but the problem with ransomware is, is when you get hit, everything's down. And that's a bit of the, how do you call it, of the issue uh, with ransomware. If we go a step further, uh, what type of solutions are there actually to, uh, to protect your vessel? Well, the baseline is, and that's the, the live buoy is awareness. Um, uh, next week, there will be uh, uh, more information about awareness by, uh, by another speaker, but basically train your users repeatedly, track the progress, examine them. Uh, there are multiple solutions in the industry, um, just Laurie said, three secure endpoints as well, uh, that has a awareness module, which can actually train your users, have proper maritime question like, okay, you find a USB drive in the hallway, what do you do with it? Um, kind of questions and not, not, not I, leave, uh, I leave my laptop in the car questions. Uh, so basically that's the, the baseline uh, that will keep you afloat. But if you're going to compare it with a lifeboat, then the antivirus is the, mo uh, the most basic version, uh, which will protect vessels from a USB virus uh, and so on. Uh, often it has no uh, advanced protecting features uh, for network protection and that kind of stuff. But if you upgrade that lifeboat to add an engine, for example, uh, you get to the endpoint security level. And the endpoint security level uh, will protect you from network threats, meaning that ransomware from a crew laptop that's trying to infect the, uh, uh, the business network uh, will be blocked. Often also has anti-ransomware capabilities, uh, has a firewall, uh, so you need to allow traffic within your network. Uh, and it's most important of all, I heard this question quite a lot, it will replace your antivirus. Often customers think, yeah, I need an antivirus and I need an endpoint security solution. Well, that's not the case. Endpoint security always covers the antivirus as well. It is a, it is a module within the endpoint security. Um, then we have the UTM, which get, uh, getting more popular in the markets. It's already in the, the normal enterprises and normal offices on shore being used quite often. Uh, there are a couple of uh, UTMs available, uh, uh, but the, the most important part of the UTM is that it will protect your IT and your OT. An endpoint solution will only protect the endpoint, that's traffic that comes in and goes out from that endpoint. But the UTM will basically uh, is the guardian of the uh, of the network and will stand uh, between the gateway and the network. So everything that comes in via satellite, 4G, or uh, you name it, to your network will be scanned and monitored, and also that leaves the network. Uh, there are UTMs that offer uh, DLP functions, data loss prevention, meaning that you can track certain files. So you can say, okay, this Word document within my network, if somebody tries to email it outside of the network, I want to get notified of it because it can be classified data. Uh, the advantage of a UTM as well is a machine sandboxing. So you don't have to upload everything to the cloud, although they also offer cloud scanning. Uh, and it's an additional on top of the endpoint. So it's your next generation firewall um, but be very particular which type of firewall you choose or which type of UTM you choose. There are UTMs in the, uh, available in the market that had last year 40 exploits available. Uh, if you have those solutions, then please reconsider the type of solution you're using. Uh, so again, this is the lifeboat with a, a, a hard bow, uh, with a steering wheel uh, and with chairs for the crew. So again, you're raising your likelihood to survive. And if you want to really finish it off, you have NDR, Network Detection and Response. That's the, the latest addition. It already exists for a couple of years, um, but it protects, it protects your network from threats within. So meaning that with an endpoint, you can detect everything that comes into your endpoint and leaves your endpoint. With the UTM, you can monitor everything that goes into the vessel and goes out to the vessel. But with the NDR, you can actually monitor what goes the traffic between a VDR and an engine or between a VDR and an egg disk. Uh, and so on. Uh, your endpoint or other security solutions are not doing that. So you will be able to trace the data back in the network. Uh, and it can help you to prevent breaches, of course, but also can help you if there was a breach, which can always happen, still happen, even if you have the most fancy stuff in, installed, uh, to trace it back what was causing it so that you can take actions on it. 
So here it is, basic from a live buoy to a complete live boat, all the solutions that can be used in the industry, uh, which the endpoint security and the UTM are by far the most popular at the moment. Uh, and increasing the solutions and properly implemented as well will raise the detection and the likelihood of survival. It's the same with the lifeboat. The more uh, complete your lifeboat will be, the more the, the bigger the likelihood that your crew will survive. But an important thing to note as well is that too often we see that customers, we buy that endpoint solution, we go to a website, uh, we go to eset.com, we go to another vendor, uh, we buy it, we implement it and install and forget. Well, that's not the, that's not the case because cybersecurity is not install and forget. You really need to manage it. Uh, and we can actually see that if we take a look at the threats that we detect because cybersecurity is, uh, is the viruses that you find on your USB drives and so on. But it's also about uh, interpreting thing, what kind of threats you see. Uh, the number two detection that we actually have seen on the computers is a Kingsoft D, which is basically spyware. And it's a translation program that vessels are installing. So they are installing a translation software, which they translate their Chinese, English, Japanese documents uh, with, but the translation happens uh, offsite, so on shore. So the entire document is sent over to a third party file server, you get a translation back, but you basically just have given that entire document to another company that can use it for free. So that's software that we really often see and we really encourage customers to not use it because you're not knowing what they're going to do with that data. Uh, so we call that a potential unwanted application, a PUA. Uh, the other thing is, how can you interpret the firewall events? Do you have your employees there that can actually are doing that? Like the secure, security vulnerability exploitation is ransomware in your network trying to breach. Uh, often that comes from a crew, from a crew laptop uh, that's infected, they bring it aboard, plug it in the network and it's trying to infect the other machines. So again, segmentation uh, using a UTM, for example, uh, is really helpful um, in, this kind of, in this matter. So you should understand the data that you see if you, buy, if you implement something off the shelf yourself, you don't have the employees or the time or the personnel to do it, then please uh, use a third party company to do that. Because when you're going to do that, uh, with managed services such as Fleece Secure, you can see that you can actually uh, minimize your costs, maximize the efficiency. Uh, you should see that, that the product that you uh, purchase or uh, purchase from the company, uh, that you uh, extend your team with it. So those guys in the security operating center that are sitting here in the Port IT office, they, uh, they are an extension of your team. Uh, they can help you with threat hunting. Where did a threat come from? Because if you can, you can kill the threat in your network, but it would be very helpful to see uh, where was, what's the origin of the threat? Was it a USB drive? Was it the website? Was it a third party machine? Maybe it was the agent laptop and so on. They can assist you with that. So it's actually obtaining additional employees uh, within your company that can assist you with that kind of things. But they also have a rapid incident response and they do event investigation. That's the threat hunting part as well. Uh, they closely monitor all the threats. And as, what's important as well is that the companies that you choose to, uh, uh, to have your managed services with, that, you give, that they give you an insight on the items that they detect. A lot of times we see that companies are very eager to close down what they actually have detected on your network. Uh, be open about it. Make sure that you can actually see what's happening on your network and, so, uh, and deal with that so that you can learn as well. Uh, you can use that extension of that team to grow your own team and grow the knowledge within your company uh, and not hold you back uh, uh, so, that you, uh, so that you can't grow yourself. Uh, so this is very, very brief information uh, on, the, on the part. Uh, uh, I'm happy to answer all the questions later on. Wow, well, thank you very much, Yuri. And just for the audience, you see there's a few questions coming up. You can also upvote questions. So it gives us an idea of what's most interesting and some, some meaty uh, <laughs> questions we've got coming in. So, so finally, we're going to hear from Dr. Michalis Mikaloliakos, team leader, cybersecurity and network with TMS Cardiff Gas and TMS Tankers, who's going to share his experiences. So I'd like to welcome Michalis. Thank you. Thank you very much. One moment to start my presentation. Yeah. So we're going to, to discuss about the adoption of faulty devices 
and how this uh, new surface has been increased, uh, especially in what we call the digital ecosystem on board uh, the LNG vessel and about the risk and the cybersecurity threats and danger. So what is the current need that we have in LNG industry is for all, for an ICT engineer, a cybersecurity engineer, or an OT engineer related with, uh, with operational technology. I think that is the need to adapt. Why? Because, you know, OT is a new addition to this digital surface on board. And for some reason we need to be familiar with OT. So uh, we need to dynamically adapt it and, uh, you know, have a, a new skill development features uh, because this is something new. Uh, why digital operational technology on board? Because the operational efficiency could be enhanced. There is faster decision making. There is real time control. There is reduction in maintenance time, uh, time and optimization of processes in general. There is switching from reactive repair to predictive and preventive maintenance. And there is an increase on the provided services. From my point of view, from a technology point of view, I think that somehow we try to manipulate the produced uh, data and handle the different traffic profiles on board the vessel. So what is the current OT landscape in uh, LNG industry? OT become digital, always available, meaning that they're interconnected anywhere, including vessels network, public internet, and make, uh, makers network. Always connected in our world means always a target. So the threat surface has been expanded rapidly. There is a huge increase on in the data transfer outside and inside the vessel uh, from 400, 500 gigabyte on the last generation of LNG to one tera uh, in the new generation. There is an increase on uh, the numbers of OT systems on board. For example, in our LNG vessel, we have more than uh, 14 different OT systems. That means 14 different OT networks. That means 14 different uh, traffic profiles on board. Um, we have systems like cargo and engine monitoring systems, main engine monitoring systems, auxiliary engine monitoring systems, systems for ship's performance, emissions monitoring systems, lossing monitoring system, collaboration platforms with reporting, dashboards with uh, artificial intelligence capabilities, marine navigation system for collision avoidance, remote monitoring for navigation, communication elements, services for maps and publications, and different from two or three different vendors and providers. Uh, so we have to do a lot with the, these new connectivity requirements. We have connectivity requirements to the public internet for data analytics and remote connectivity, uh, connectivity requirements within the vessel's network for saving data, for sending data to the office or sending email to the outside world. So for example, we need to have a convergence between the OT and the IT network. Um, also, we have to give access to our corporate network because all these OT systems, many of these OT systems have dashboards that the crew needs to have access to. Uh, of course, there are connectivity requirements to the makers network uh, via VPN connections for data analysis or remote trap shooting and assistance, and also for maintenance uh, reasons. And more traditional, let's say, OT systems have USB uh, ports for update and upgrade uh, purposes. So the threat landscape has been extended. Uh, we have heard about the autonomous vessels, but before the vessel become autonomous should be digital and while it's digital should be secured. So more or less the, the main threat in the OT environment is focusing on the downtime of this OT, but for sure could be subject to injuries, damage of reputation of the company because cybersecurity is not only for technologies, not only for processes or, or human factor, but it's an excellent marketing tool in our days. Uh, could be subject to the loss of confidential information and, of course, to a high cost of recovery. So what we should do with keeping the OT symbol? We should start establishing uh, the baseline. We can protect whatever is visible. 
whatever we can understand. So there are some questions that we should raise uh, regarding the OT. Do we have the knowledge of the OT daily operation? For example, I mean, do we know what the current OT system, uh, how it's operating and what is the, uh, the profile of it? Do we know what kind of interconnections this OT system have with the relevant network inside and outside the vessel? Do we know the training or the maturity level of the personnel that handling the OT on board? Do we have a clear view of the flows incoming and outgoing? Is OT protected by the maker or by the owner? Is this a shared responsibility? For example, uh, there are many makers that they are using their own antivirus or advanced threat protection systems on the OT. Is OT cybersecurity incident plan part of the current drills or the assessment on board? This, these are questions that uh, need to be answered. So in an effort to keep this simple, uh, we should create a cybersecurity map to identify, for example, to have an inventory of the asset in order to effectively manage the risks against the system, uh, to create a map of the data flows, to have clear roles and responsibility on board for the cybersecurity, and also conducting this assessment as risk assessment is one of the most important aspects of cybersecurity. Uh, we need to protect these OT systems with access control measures, um, identify, determine the appropriate content of cybersecurity awareness and training for the personnel on board, uh, have a configuration baseline with technical measures and security policies uh, of these systems, and also create a cyber se security manual uh, for the personnel on board related with the process and processes for both IT uh, and OT. Proceed then with the detection, have a continuous monitoring system um, to identify the traffic flows of uh, either IT and OT. For example, we are using a 24 seven security operation center uh, for this. Proceed on vulnerability assessment. This is something new for the OT, but there are vulnerability assessment tools with OT plugins. And if we cannot proceed on an aggressive vulnerability scanning, we can do it on a passive way. Create a cybersecurity response plan that will ensure that each cyber incident will be reported, investigated, contained, and remediated. And at the end, create a recovery planning because you know resilience is the ability to adapt, respond, and recover rapidly from uh, any uh, disruption. At the end, it's very important to have what we say security by design or security in project manager management meaning that before installing anything new on board, on board the vessel, we should be aware that we have followed the cybersecurity requirements during the project management, have clear requests for clear directions provided by the maker related with the operational technology. And, you know, we are not uh, OT cybersecurity experts. So we th I think that we should embrace an open and sharing environment related with uh, OT vulnerabilities in order to become uh, OT cybersecurity experts. Thank you very much. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I love we get back into that NIST framework, making a map so this stuff is so complicated, but we make it easier to understand. I think that's, uh, that's fantastic. We started off with this framework, we finished with this <laughs> the framework. And, uh, yeah, well, that's great. We've had lots of questions come in and lots of written answers. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing open at the moment. I've got plenty of my own questions, but um, if anybody wants to ask any more questions or we can go back and um, discuss some of the others. I, I'm personally, one of the ones I thought was most intriguing was this one from uh, from, from Renjith Thomas, how do you implement cybersecurity on board? I said, first of all, that's too broad a question. So we should do something more specific. And he's come back and he said, look, this question is being asked of me in a, that sounds like a sort of training class. So I, I, want, I want an answer to this question, but I think the best answer is if you wanted to do it in two lines, map out your identify, protect, detect, 
respond and recover. I don't know if anybody would like to, <laughs> if you wanted to answer this, is it an exam question or a very, very short answer? Would anybody like to? And Yuri, I guess you've, I mean, Michalis, you've just answered that, I guess, with your last few slides. Is there, maybe, I don't know if anybody else wants to add about a, we wanted to sum this up in 10 lines as if it was an exam question. Well, yeah, well, if you have a pr proper approach from, from our side would be first, well, uh, decide what type of application, what, what do you want to protect? Uh, do you only want to protect the endpoints? Do you also want to protect the OT? So that's step one. Um, if you go after that, if you have made your decision, uh, implement and make sure that you actually know um, uh, what you have on board. So protecting a network, what we often see also with, with, with Immersat Fleet Secure Endpoint, uh, customers say, well, we only have like 10 devices on the network. And then they install the uh, Fleet Secure Endpoint solution and it begins scanning the network and suddenly there are one, 140 devices on the network. So uh, knowing what you actually have on your network also makes the, uh, it an more easy to choose a proper solution afterwards. Uh, and then it's actually, it's maintaining. So make sure that you actually monitor it. It's not install and forget. Sure, it's updating by itself, but what kind of threats are happening? Like when we, intro when we introduced antivirus in the industry uh, in back in 2007, uh, everybody said, we just need an antivirus. And everybody was happy with it. But now you actually want to see what is that system doing? What, I'm, what, what am I paying for? And it's actually doing something for me. So then you can steer, if you see that there is a lot of USB threads, then you can say, okay, we're going to use, block the USB ports, uh, for example. Or if you see that there are a lot of viruses on Facebook because they're browsing, we're going to block Facebook because we see too many traffic to that. So you can actively close down the system to uh, make a prevention. So it's step-by-step. Step. It's not possible to go from zero to 100 in one single implementation. It's a process that you need to learn as a company. So as Darren Meredith is uh, sort of a bit provocative, he's Director of Information Technology at Security Ocean Technologies. Are you promoting the NIST framework? I mean, personally, I would promote anything that made this stuff clearer to understand. And uh, that's exactly what the NIST framework appears to do. <laughs> I don't know if anybody wants to. I mean, McAllis and Laurie, you've both mentioned this framework in your talk. So I guess you obviously think it's a good framework to use. Does anybody want to add anything there? Yeah, I, I mean, I think with the NIST framework, it, it tries to make it simple. And I think, you know, referring back to the last question, it's a really good question as in how do you do this? Because if you could answer it in 10, 10 words or less, then uh, it would be a very simple problem to solve. But, you know, it, it's, uh, it is quite challenging to explain. And I think that's indicative because it's a risk management approach you need. It's not, here's a checklist, follow the checklist it's identify the risks and then work to, uh, you know, to mitigate against those risks. Um, and I think the NIST framework is um, a very good way of structuring how you identify the risks, how you protect and how you mitigate them, and then how you sort of continue to do so. So I think it's, a, it, it's one way of simplifying your approach, you know, in a few words, and, and it gives you a, a framework that you can start to plan. Uh, so for me, I think, you know, I like it um, for, for, for its simplicity in that sense and, and its usability across the board. Oh, OK. And another question I've got is about this OTIT. And Yuri, in your talk, I think it's probably fair to say that was all about Windows. I don't know if other systems can get viruses. I mean, possibly they can. But then, Michalis, you were talking about systems for monitoring, which is not Windows. Are we saying that Windows is the main threat? Sort of vector here. No, maybe. Well, no, no, well, sure, sure. Win Windows is one of the biggest. Uh, it's the, it's the most widely used operating system in the world. So, uh, if I was a hacker, I would write a virus quickly for uh, for Windows. Then I do this for a Linux system or macOS or something like that. Uh, but no, you can also there are also breaches like on SCADA systems. Uh, if we go way back, we have uh, the the power plants, nuclear power plants in Iran that had stuck net, uh, a Stuxnet virus. So that was a SCADA virus attack. So basically, uh, you need to protect both on them. Um, the biggest issue at the moment is indeed your normal office PC that you use on the vessel for communication. Uh, but there are threats that can also mingle with GPS systems uh, or with uh, engine monitoring control and so on. So for that, you need to OT. Uh, which you can actually protect with a with UTM. And if you want to monitor what type of traffic, what's even more important, um, and then you need to have the NDR solution implemented. Well, I mean, your, your talk was mainly about viruses, so maybe it's fair to say 80% of the focus should be on viruses and 
twenty percent on other equipment. I don't know if that's a useful yeah, certification. No, you, you can also have a virus on, on your VDR, for example. So yeah, it's still a virus because what, what's the definition of a virus? It's a malicious program that tries to interact with the machine and uh, uh, have a behavior that's not uh, not normal anymore. So yeah, it's just malicious traffic in general. Wow. So uh, that Darren Meredith, I was just about to Google DLP, but I didn't have time. But um, data he's asking for yeah. data. Lot. Okay. So well, that's included in this in the recover part, isn't it? He, he's asking about what happens if data is compromised. Is that in the NIST framework? That's a. I'd, I'd say it is, isn't it? Yeah. I'm just. I'm just reading a question. But what about when the data is compromised? Endpoints don't always cover DLP. No, that's correct. Uh, you have software for that as well. DLP software. That's. And but the problem with DLB software as well is that you have, um, it also is a privacy issue. Like it's depending on the country that you're in. Like in the Netherlands, uh, employees can use the internet during business hours up to a certain point, of course. Uh, but you're not allowed to inspect what type of traffic they are doing unless you sus suspect that they're trying to do something illegal. Uh, so you're, you're in a gray area on the legal matter. But with DLP, you can go as far as the, the letters that you type, the passwords that you fill in, the emails that you send and so on, everything that's being done in that endpoint, you can track down with DLP. Uh, on the UTM level, often you can see just, just a data exchange. So a file that's leaving your vessel that has been marked, that extension has been marked as a, uh, a, a file that needs to be monitored. So there are a lot of varieties in the data loss prevention. Uh, and it's indeed, it, it can be complex, but if properly implemented, uh, yeah, it shouldn't be any problem, but again, it will bring additional cost to that customer. Well, can I go back to McCallis talk about the practical experience? There's a question from Ninetta Palemi about, do you think cybersecurity certification is a useful measure? And I'd also, do you have any actual experience about audits under IMO 2021? Is, is, is people yeah. ports control actually come on board? And Yeah, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, type of audits that uh, we're passing every year. I think that now, for now, for onboard the vessel, there are two ways to, you know, to start with the cybersecurity certification. Either the vessel could be a remote site on the ISO related with the ISO 27001, and uh, for now, I think that uh, also the classes we have a cybersecurity notation by classes, so this is also something that is related with uh, certification. And this is the way that we will move forward. So we are in the preparation of receiving a cybersecurity class notation. Oh, okay. Le Leif Brodfagen is asking how often you should renew your risk assessment. Is that for lorry, perhaps? Is that a, that's a bit of a vague question, I suppose, <laughs> as often no, as you I, need to, I, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, no, but again, it's a good, it's a good question, isn't it? And I think it sort of further highlights that risk management approach. You know, the answer is it, it depends, and it depends on um, on your assessment of the risks. Um, I think, I mean, my answer would be review it as often as you can. Um, it has to be uh, practical, but at the same time, as as everybody um, you know states, and as, as you stated in the question, um, the threat is evolving at an alarming rate. So. You know, as, as measures are put in place and, and so on to protect things, then naturally, um, you know, the threat evolves. But I think having the, the good solution that also, you know, is evolving as well certainly helps. Um, so if you, you know, if you have that endpoint security that's using multiple engine scanning, multiple, you know, ways of detecting the latest viruses that's being updated, you know, you're updating your, um, your measures as you go. You know, that's certainly uh, helping a lot. And then I think it's your, you know, your risk management system as well, which, you know, should be regularly reviewed, updated and tested. Yeah. And I think in, in handling with that, if you have a third party assisting you with, you can actually ask them, what are you seeing in my network? Do I need to take additional steps? What would you advise in that matter uh, to improve uh, so that you can stay, stay that step ahead? We've got a great question from uh, Gregor Ross. We have a stimulating one here. So you're better having independent OT systems all talking separately to shore or controlling everything down one pipe. We had a, a couple of weeks ago, we had a webinar from a Telenar 
a different you have a separate communications link for OT devices as a possible solution to OT security. But uh, maybe that's for Yuri as a technical question. Do you think is that? Well, yeah, Gregor always has those nice questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, well, yeah, if you have multiple connections, is it is that feasible? That's also the the other things. Uh, I would say if you have one pipe that you can protectly uh, protect correctly, that would be enough. You can monitor the data. You can really see what kind of traffic is flowing through that pipe. Uh, so you don't need to have multiple connections for every OT system. Uh, there are vessels with, with uh, at least a thousand different OT devices. Uh, do you need different pipes for every? That, that's unmanageable. So if you have one pipe um, uh, set up, there are companies already busy with, how do you call it, autonomous sailing vessels, and they will use one, uh, one big pipe to their data center around the world. They have a couple of them. And based on that, they're going to monitor the data that's going from and to the vessel. So in that case, you only need one pipe, uh, but it need, be, need it needs to be a proper uh, protected one. Wow. So we've got a, well, more from Darren Meredith. I, I, I like this. Um, I mean, one of the things about maps is you can use as many maps as you like and go into as much detail as you like. So CMMC, I've just Googled his cybersecurity maturity model certification so that's a sort of map that goes into more detail just reading into the name not knowing anything about it but uh i mean but there's also a question about when people come in and inspect what they actually want to see which i suppose is a so i don't know if this is an issue we can go deeper in than we've got already i mean i suppose basically you just have to convince whoever comes on board that you're safe is what it comes down to is can we talk I about think there's a lot of different uh you know there's there's different guidelines you can follow. There's different approaches you can follow. You know, IMO 2021 is in the state and you have to follow a, a certain um, set of guidelines or a certain list or, or an approach. It's that you have considered the risks on board and you've addressed them appropriately. Uh, and as, I think, as I said earlier, you know, there's lots of different uh, approaches. The IMO sort of presents a few um, guidelines, but you don't need to follow those ones in particular. Um, so... If, if this is the, the guidelines that suits, you know, and, and you feel that that's the most robust way, uh, robust way of, of meeting the uh, the risks that you have on board, then, you know, it makes good sense to follow that one. Um, and, and I think, you, you know, I, 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 I'm not in a position to recommend one set of guidelines over the other, because I think it depends on the, the circumstances of the operator and, um, and the risks that they identify. But I think the point is there's lots of different approaches and sets of guidelines that you can take and it, you know it's good to adopt the right one for uh, for you i mean he's added an extra point that this has more requirements on supplier management and supplier responsibility uh, i'm not sure how important suppliers are in risk management for shipboard it's not like we're accounting company getting accounting software updates to the ships that might contain viruses like like Maersk did i mean it's, I, I, I don't know if anybody well it's we we have we have seen it before that a car, that a, that a captain got a new PC actually. Um, they installed the PC on board, and then they applied their security package on it, and it instantly it was actually infected. It was a legal an illegal Windows version running uh, that they got they got from short. Well, yeah, it was cheap. Uh, so having a a fixed supplier saying as a company we only purchase from HP, from Dell, or so on, and we only get the uh, the PCs are being supplied from our office to the vessel. Uh, and that's the same with the other applications. Uh, you have those, how do you call it, uh, supply chain attacks, meaning that then uh, Solar Winds was one. Uh, they hacked the, uh, the, the vendor, they inject malware into that code, you install it, and later on you get hacked. So even that happens. So you need to do a risk assessment on your suppliers as well uh, to see, okay, if they are uh, keeping their structure up to date. Uh, Carl, uh, sorry for the interruption. Related with the OT, Yes, there is. There are OT systems that, are, let's say, have specific malware provided by the maker. So this is not something that we can have access to. So uh, this we are relied to, you know, to the malware, let's say, updates or upgrades that the maker is doing. So we, what we should do is, you know, to make clear about the demarcation point between the owner and the maker there. Because at the moment, there are OT systems that uh, you know that we don't have access to. They are, they are installed on board our vessels, but we don't have any access. There are black boxes for us. That's why we need you know, to clarify 
well, which is our role and our responsibility, where is the responsibility of the maker? Because if any cybersecurity incident uh, is on, on its systems, you know, we, we need to see how we should recover it. So one of our proposal is to make drills and assessments with the maker. Because, you know, this is a system where we don't have access to it. All the IT manufacturers are very large companies, or nearly all, with Siemens and uh, MAN, I don't know, if maybe I'm stuff from Chinese suppliers or something like that. I mean, I mean, if you deal with a really big company, that's, you're not going to do a risk assessment on Siemens, for example, are you? Yes, for the IT, but I'm, I'm talking about the OT. Yeah, OT comes from big companies. <laughs> Yeah, yeah this is, this is, this is, you know, you know, this this is different. But I, I don't think that I think that we need to invest more in cybersecurity uh, response plans in cooperation with the OT makers. But 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 even on the uh, on the uh, if you go, if I go to a vessel, I actually, not been there for a while. But when I did go to the vessels, what often was the case as well, you go on board as an engineer, and you roam free on the vessel. There's nobody monitoring what you're actually doing. So you can put a device connecting to the OT, but even more easy, you can copy the entire machine that you're working on to a USB drive and show along with the data. So then there is no malicious threat and the user is doing it. So we, I one time in my entire career, career have been asked the question, what type of data did you copy to the USB drive and can I see it? And I've been over a thousand vessels. So that's actually the, the first point for cybersecurity to take away is when you have a user on your vessel or a guest on your vessel that access your machines, ask them and check them, what kind of data have you been copying? Um, and it's the same with the OT as well. You, you don't have access to their software. So if, if that engineer boards your vessel, what have you been doing? Have a really brief report because that's eventually the only thing that you can do. Uh, trust that vendor that you have chosen, um, but they should also be honest. And if you can prove it up to a certain point that you have taken your message, then yeah. Well, we're planning to finish at 11 o'clock. We've got some great questions. Maybe we'll give each of you one minute each to pick <laughs> one of these questions. Clayton Ng is asking for the three biggest wins you could do, although Darren Meredith has also answered that. Pericles Papoutsakis is asking, do you really need a SOC uh, Security Operations Center, 24-7 cyber monitoring. Darren Meredith is asking about downstream attacks. I've heard of one where pirates attack ships based on information they got by hacking. And Dominic Sterlang is asking about GPS spoofing. Should we take a minute each to... Laurie, do you want the first choice? <laughs> yes, please, yeah. Keep it simple for me, thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go with the first one and give my view. But I think um, in terms of three biggest wins, and perhaps I would... I would phrase this as, as perhaps the three easiest wins or the three simplest things to do, uh, and certainly something which I, th I feel uh, you know most operators can do. That's probably you know perhaps less budget um, uh, strenuous than, than some of the others. So I, I think first and foremost, and we haven't mentioned it a great deal here, is train your crew. You know, introduce some form of crew awareness training. Do it regularly because uh, you know people can be seen as the weakest part of the whole process. Um, you know, so if they are aware of, of uh, phishing emails and so on, they can help prevent these attacks getting on board. You can then further strengthen that part of your um, of your of your cyber measures by uh, segregating the crew network from the business network. Uh, and there's simple ways of doing this, such as you know, fleet hotspot. Very simply, you can introduce that, and then you've got a whole segregated crew network to keep your business network completely clear. Um, and then lastly, naturally, uh, I would say get fleet secure endpoint as a, as a simple, uh, simple solution to, uh, to harden the cyber. Oh, fantastic. Yuri, do you want to answer maybe on GPS spoofing or um, network monitoring 24-7? Uh, well, yeah, the network monitoring, that's, that's important because, well, if you want to do, how do you call it, if you detect a threat and you can act directly, you can prevent further damage in the network. Uh, why 24 seven? Well, yeah, we are in Rotterdam and the vessel is in Japan and it's nighttime over there, but when I go to sleep, it will be morning over there. Uh, so you, that's why you need to 24 seven uh, part. So you can really act upon when the incident is happening. So it's really valuable to do that. Um, 
Uh, and on the GPS spoofing part, yeah, it, it happens, but not that often, luckily. So it's... Uh... So, so Michaelis, you yes. know, I heard about a Greek company that got pirate attacks from somebody <laughs> hacking into the systems and also... Gregor's party is just asking if we need a uh, dedicated security officer on board. I don't know, maybe you want to. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, we need a dedicated cybersecurity officer on board, but for sure we need to train the captain and uh, the staff on board to act, let's say, as the first cyber defenders on board for, for different things. And uh, also I would like to reply for the 24-7 shock, you know, it depends on the vessel's operations. When we're talking for LNG, we have a vast uh, number of data that are being exchanged through the public internet. Um, we have a lot of uh, an increased number of OT systems. We have firewalls on board, and I, I truly believe that uh, is very valuable. So I fully agree with, uh, with Yuri. For example, in bulkers vessels, the traffic demands are lower. Um, so it all depends on the operation of uh, the vessels and the traffic profiles that we have. Wow. Well, I think it's been a fantastic discussion. We covered an enormous <laughs> bandwidth of uh, different topics. Next week, we're going to be uh, doing a session on seafarer training at the same time. And I'll pass back to Vida for closing things. Thank you. You're on mute. A mute side. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So we had the Lori, Eve, Yuri Hart, and Michaelis Michaliakos sharing their best knowledge and practical advice on shipboard cybersecurity. As Carl already invited you, please join us next Tuesday to the last webinar from this series and keep an eye on Digital Ship LinkedIn page for any updates. Now we are signing off. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.